Good afternoon. Hey. Uh, you know, you got to love the energy in the room. This is all Grand Valley all the time. I love that. So thank you guys for being here at uh, first the provost and I are hosting uh, Fireside Chats. And um, this is our first. And we thought, what a wonderful opportunity to do this during inauguration. It's not really week. It started yesterday. It's Wednesday through Saturday. But inauguration mini week, how's that? Um, and we tried to be really thoughtful around the inauguration as a moment for us as a university to each do our own individual reflections on the journey for our university and our work. And so you probably read in what is now called GV Next instead of GV Now, um, the uh, article that kicked off the inauguration activities, which was a convening we did in this very room yesterday with um, educators, uh, folks who are investing in education from the philanthropic side, uh, as well as from the corporate side, some of our best K-12 public and charter schools, superintendents, uh, faculty members, to have a conversation about high impact models and the future of education in the 21st century. And what was really um, inspiring about that was the number of people that were coming to share, be thought activators for us. We had. Google's uh, education evangelist. We had uh, Sony's head of learning and development. We had the head of the Kellogg Foundation. And so about 20 people, and I and the provost and Jesse Bernal, who put this all together, sat in the room across the way. And their impressions of our university and the conversation that we were having was really, really um, strong and I think profound for us, as well as substantive to learn from, be guided around, and move forward with more and more players in our network. Similarly, uh, the provost and I thought it was really critical to have our first conversation during this part of the week. And you will see that this morning there was alumni breakfast, and there is many student uh, celebrations where um, I will go to them because I don't think the highlight of their week is to come to a ceremony in the middle of the day and from many campuses, and just um, be encouraging them to reflect on being Grand Valley. What does it mean to be a Laker for a life? How will you give back? How are you thinking about um, our institution going forward? So what better conversation than about learning in the 21st century? And with a very good colleague who I worked with nearly all of the 20 years at Northeastern University, who um, is my own personal thought partner, colleague, friend, but a scholar uh, and a faculty member that um, has done her life's work around what works in learning, and most recently around how we move into the 21st century as we think about the context change that we're, um, we're facing. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my partner and colleague, the provost, to do the more formal introduction. So thank you, Maria. Thank you. Well, good morning. I guess it's not morning, but it always feels so awkward to say good day, like I'm British or something. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, before I do offer a formal introduction of our guest, I would like uh, just for her to understand who we are a little bit. Could you, by show of hands, just raise your hand if you have ever attended an event or an activity hosted by our Faculty Teaching and Learning Center? OK. Now, the reason I asked you to do that is because we know that we are a community of teacher scholars and that we are committed to student-centric behavior here at Grand Valley. And I just, by show of hands, you can really see the dedication of our faculty and staff, so thank you for doing that. But we are very honored today to have Dr. Susan Ambrose with us to talk about designing education for the 21st century. Sometimes I find it hard to believe that we actually are in the 21st century, but it's 20 years now, so I guess I should get with this program. Dr. Ambrose is Senior Vice Chancellor for Educational Innovation at Northeastern University and Professor of Education and History. 
She is an internationally recognized expert in college level teaching and learning, as well as faculty development, and has worked with college and university faculty and administrators throughout the United States and around the world. Dr. Ambrose focuses on helping faculty translate their research to practice in the design of curricula, courses, and educational experiences for undergraduate, graduate students, and lifelong learners, which is a phrase we're gonna be talking a lot about here at Grand Valley. Earning her doctorate in history from Carnegie Mellon University, she spent an additional 25 years there, serving as Associate Provost for Education, Director of the Eberly Center for Teaching Excellence, and a professor in the Department of History. Where are the historians in the room? I know I've seen some. All right, you represent your people well. Dr. Ambrose is co-author of five books, the most recent, which is forthcoming um, in January, uh, Higher Education's Road to Relevance, Navigating Complexity, and her last book previous to this new one, How Learning Works, Seven Research-Based Principles for Smart Teaching, has been praised for integrating fundamental research in pedagogy and practical application, and has been translated into at least five languages. Dr. Ambrose Research has been funded by the National Science Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Lilly Endowment, Carnegie Corporation, and the Alcoa Foundation. We are honored to have you here with us. Please join me in a warm welcome to our guest. Thank you very much, Madam Provost. I love saying that. And I have to say, <laughs> even though I have 20 minutes and this is going to be a whirlwind, I've done five or six fireside chats, and this is the first time there was actually a fire, <laughs> which is really, really exciting for me. Um, anyway, thank you, and thank you, Madam President, for having me here. Um, I'm, I'm always happy to come and talk about things that keep me awake at night. Um, and some nights it's awake with anxiety, and other nights it's awake with um, possibility and the excitement of all the possibilities. So I'm actually going to share a little bit of both with you today. Um, hopefully the excitement about all the possibilities will overshadow some of the anxiety. Um, but I really do believe, as someone who studied education and history, that we are at a very unique moment in time in higher education. And while we have had other moments in time that forced us to react in ways that actually pushed higher education ahead and helped us to adapt and adjust in a way that pushed society ahead, today is very different in that the context is very different. But historically, we as a sector have always stepped up and we've always adjusted and adapted. And so I have a lot of faith that we can continue to do that. And so what I want to do today in my 20 minutes is really give you a kind of broad brush stroke about the context for change right now, the confluence of factors that have come together that really make this a unique moment in time, but that really force us, and I'm using that word purposefully, that really force us to act because the anxiety I have is that if we don't as a sector act, to stay relevant, there are a lot of third parties who are chasing us and engaging in the kinds of activities, educational activities, that some people believe are going to have much more value for cost. And I hate talking like that. That's not natural to me, having been raised as a faculty member. But in fact, I think it's really important. So I want to just very briefly share with you what I think that context is talk just for a minute about some of what I think of as the new compelling outcomes as we send our learners out into the world. And when I talk about learners, I'm really talking about learners from the time they enter uh, university as undergraduates all the way through the people who will be continually coming back as they need to um, upskill and gain new knowledge. And, and we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. And then the exciting part about designing for the future. And so I want to share with you how I've been thinking about it. Um, and a lot of these, I will say, a lot of the ways I've been thinking of, about it have actually been influenced by President Mantella. She was one of the reasons I left an institution that I grew up at and loved. Um, and, um, and moved to Northeastern because Northeastern was at a place where they really were thinking about a lot of these things. So she helped me to shape a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. 
So a uh, couple caveats very quickly. Um, and that is that I think it's clear for us uh, to understand, important for us to understand, that when the public hears higher education, um, that they think about us in a very broad brush way, right? They don't distinguish around the different kinds of institutions we are or the goals we have. And I'm saying that because when I show you some of the contextual issues, while they may be ish there may be some that are issues for Grand Valley and some that are not, it doesn't matter. When there's an admission scandal, everybody looks at all of us askance. When there's a research scandal, everybody looks at all of us askance. So whatever impacts one institution impacts all of us. I think it's important that we say that. And there are a lot of ex exaggerations out there um, that I think really influence in a negative way the kinds of discussions that we're having. And I'll point out what I mean by some of that, but I think we need to make sure that we know what reality is and not get caught up in a lot of the exaggerations. So what I want to talk about in terms of the context, and again, very broadly um, conceptualized, is the growing public concern around higher education, the radically changing employment landscape, and it is radically changing. If you talk with employers, there are a lot of things going on that are new and exciting to employers, a lot of anxiety around what their expectations are for learners who are, who are coming out of college, and then the expanding learner base and changing needs. And I want to start with something that for a long time as a faculty member made me uncomfortable, and that's this phrase, return on investment, ooh. As a faculty member in a classroom, that is not how we think about what our job is, right? At least it wasn't when I was in the classroom. And then I became an administrator and started hearing things like that, and I thought, ooh, I made a big mistake. And then I started looking at the reality. And the reality at this point in time just smacks you in the face, right, when you think about return on investment. So we all have heard, either we have children or, or grandchildren or nieces or nephews, we have all heard about debt load, right? Um, it looms large, right? But when you actually look at what that means, it becomes really overwhelming, and you understand why people use phrases like return on investment. So right now, debt load is the second largest expense that people will ever have next to buying a home. So think about that for a minute. And we've seen the numbers. Home ownership over the last decade has declined for people under the age of 35. More students are returning home after graduation. The debt right now, this moment, for people ages 20 to 30, $351 a month. And by the way, many of those are people who haven't completed their degrees. They were forced to drop out, right? Some companies, a little bit of good news, some companies are using debt assistance to recruit. It's now become a benefit. But um, in some respects, that's really very sad. So people are having to make decisions around higher education based on what it's going to mean for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Just this week, a report came out from the Pew Foundation. One in four graduates, one in four, default on their loan in the first five years. You know what that does to their credit rating for the next decade. So this is serious stuff that we really have to think about. Now, that's return on investment for our undergraduates. Think about the number of people, and I'll talk more in a minute about that, who are going to be needing to come back as a result of automation and globalization to gain new knowledge and skills. Those people are full -time, in full-time positions with family commitments. Return on investment is really important for them because they have limited time, energy, um, and effort to put into it. So th that's just one way to, to look at that aspect of, of the context. Persistence in graduation rates, we hear about that everywhere. That's in the newspapers you know, daily. I think the six-year grad rate nationally is now 59%, and for underrepresented minorities, it's actually a lot um, different. So you know, a continuing issue. Access. Access has been an issue higher education has been talking about for a long time for first generation and other underrepresented minorities. But I also want you to think about, and this is a part of the sort of new definition of learner, access for, say, the 31 to 33 million people in this country that have credits toward a degree and no degree. 
and that's holding them back. 31 to 33 million. What kind of access do they have? And if they engage with us, what is the return on investment? Can they afford to do it given the limited amount of time, energy, effort, and money that they actually have? And then add to that the many, many people whose jobs are going to change as a result of automation. Not go away, and I'll address that in a minute, but change, which means they will need to gain those skills. Who is standing by to help those people in an effective and efficient way gain the knowledge and skills they need? College readiness, um, a continual problem. For many, many years at Carnegie Mellon, I taught freshman seminar. We got amazing students. And yet, um, the, the lack of preparedness struck me every semester. So in 2018, 40% of graduates entering four-year institutions were required to take remedial classes. 40%. So you want to know why it's taking students longer to get through? Well, because they're taking all of these remedial classes. Misalignment. Um, sometimes we're criticized because we're not filling the needs that society has. So we all know and we see the numbers around STEM um, disciplines and jobs that there are a lot of those out there. The healthcare industry has, has joined that, that there's a lot of shortages across healthcare occupations. And those shortages are projected to grow in the next five to seven years by 80 million to 130 million. And think about this in terms of, that's globally, the aging population globally and the longer life expectancies, right? So the question the public has is, are you preparing the right people who are going to be able to take the jobs that we as a society, a nation, a world actually need? And then there's always the political and social context. Some people think liberal bias on campus, conservative bias on campus. There's cynicism around a lot of what we do. The latest is the admission scandal. But again, you know, when there's research misconduct, where aspersions are cast on all of us. Um, and then finally, there's the, the competition. There's sort of confusion sometimes in the marketplace, but there's competition. Um, we know that nationally, that, that high school graduates are projected to drop nationally by 9% between 2026 and 2031. Um, but we also know in states like Michigan, that's already started to happen. So we're going to be competing for a, a lot of the same students. So that's, that's part of the, the context, is the growing public concern. And, um, and I understand that growing public concern. And when I look at it, part of me says, I'm glad my two children are through college. And then I look and recognize that I have a grandchild now. And, and I hopefully will have more. And what does this context mean for them? And how is higher education going to respond? Then there's the radically changing employment landscape. And if you haven't read Thomas Friedman's book, Thank You for Being Late, An Optimist Guide to Thriving in the Age of Accelerations, it's worth a read. Because he talks about this notion that it's not the, just a perception that things are moving more quickly, that things are moving more quickly in the world in which we live. And I think we all feel that on a daily basis. He talks about three interacting forces that speed one another up. Um, the market and its expansion and, and the speed of globalization, Moore's law of expon exponential acceleration of computing power, and then Mother Nature, a lot of the things that are happening with climate change and population growth and, and such. And so he makes a very convincing argument for if you're feeling this pace um, has accelerated, in fact, the pace of change has accelerated. And then there's the automation. And this is one of the areas in which I think people are going crazy with exaggerations. The most balanced um, analysis that I have seen of this came out in 2017 by the McKinsey Global Institute. They put out two reports, and they did it right. Instead of looking at occupations, they looked at job tasks, roles and responsibilities, across industries, across levels of organizations, and across the globe. And what they concluded in their analysis is that in 2017, one half of work activities globally had the potential to be automated using current technology. One half of work activities. Now, obviously, that's going to vary you know, in particular jobs and across sectors, but on average. Put another way, about 60% of jobs had at least 30% of automata automatable activities 
which translated to about 9 to 26% of work hours. What all that means simply is that all of us are going to be affected, right? The technology is going to do the things that technology does well, and in many cases, it's the mundane things that, you know, amen, right? That's fine, which then allows humans to be more creative and, and, and access and use those creative capacities. But what it means is everybody's job is going to change. And so I think we really need to think about that in terms of what it means for higher education. If 26% of the of your job changes, that means you'll be doing something else which you may not be prepared for. And companies are worried because they don't have the L&D knowledge or resources to do something about it. So companies are looking to higher education to say, how are you, how are we going to deal with all these people who need to come back and gain knowledge or skills, maybe discrete, maybe bigger chunks, but how are we going to deal with it? And then globalization, we've heard a lot about that, you know, the expanded number of places and people who are participating in the world economy. And what does that mean? It means there's increased competition for jobs for our graduates. There's an increased need for cultural agility among our graduates. Um, changing nature of organizations. If you, if you read the reports or you interact with employers, you're hearing a lot of things like much more team-centric, agile, networked, breaking down silos, distributing power so people can self-manage and act, along with remote working and flex hours. Um, a lot of, of different organizations structuring, restructuring themselves differently. Um, you can look at everything from Walmart and Target to Zappos and Deloitte and McKinsey, a lot of change in organizations. They're not the kinds of organizations we were sending our graduates into, you know, even five years ago, seven years ago. Um, the diverse workplace. Interesting that, that when you talk to employers, this is where we get credit that we've been doing something right because they're seeing a lot more young people come into the workforce having the cultural agility that they didn't see people 10 or 20 or 30 years having. A, having. That's the good news. The bad news is that for the first time ever, we have a multi-generational workforce that um, is struggling to communicate across those generations. So the latest data for 2017-18 was 56 million millennials in the workforce, 56 million, 53 million Gen Xers, and 41 million baby boomers. Okay, that is a, a first in history. And, how, and, and, and we all know, especially if we're in the classroom with students or interacting in our staff positions with students, we all know that they do things differently, right? They communicate very differently. This is causing a problem in organizations, and a lot of people are spending a lot of time and resources in their L&D programs trying to help people learn how to communicate effectively and work effectively across generations. And then finally, the employer view of the world. Employers know things are moving quickly. Employers know that they're going to have to be engaged in figuring out how to you know, get the employees they have um, to a place where they can continually learn so that they have the ability to help the organization be successful. A lot of employers are now using this word um, when they talk about hiring, and the word is learnability, right? And it's very interesting to say, how do you, how do you articulate that, and how do you select for it? But what they recognize is if they don't have young people that they're hiring out of college with the ability to continue to learn in a work-based environment, they're going to have problems. So they're really looking at, at learnability. Um, Google, I don't like the phrase, but they talk about hiring learning animals. Um, you can see why I don't like that phrase, but the idea is learnability. That's what they're looking for, and they have all kind of cool things that they try to do as they're interviewing, as many companies do now, to try and get at that. And then the final part of the uh, context really is the expanding learner base and the changing learner needs. And by this point in time, you probably know what I mean by that. So we have the traditional learners, and we said those numbers are decreasing. We still need to serve those young people. But, you know, the new traditional learner moving into the future is probably going to be the adult who's coming back a number of different times to gain the knowledge and skills that they need to either do their current job, which has changed, move up in the organization, or switch jobs. And so we have to think about that population of learners. 
which is a population as a sector we haven't thought enough about. We, we, know, we knew people came back for MBAs and we knew people came back for master's degrees. Where we're saying now that while that may work for some of the people, that's not going to work for many of the people. So we have to think about what value we can add to help those people get what they need when they need it. And so when I think about compelling outcomes, and by the way, if you want copies of the slides, I will leave them with someone. Um, but when I think about compelling outcomes, some of these are the outcomes that as, as higher education response to the changing um, society over the course of our history, um, we, have, we have dealt with, right? So always through our research and our education, what we tried to do is, is prepare people to address the world's political, economic, and social challenges, right? So we want people to solve, and we've always wanted them to solve some of the big issues. And we know this generation is really interested in poverty and clean water and um, social inequality and clean energy and the aging urban infrastructure. Um, and so those grand challenges have been really important. As institutions of higher education, we've always cared about the reflecting the human experience and imagining the future, right? And that doesn't only lie within our humanities and our fine arts, right? It lies across the institution. And what we know as we're moving into the world that we're moving into is that solving a lot of these problems are really really going to require that we think about the scientific and the technical along with the human, right? Along with the human. So those things need to be much more interdisciplinary. And then if you look at the bottom of the list, I would say most institutions always wanted to, to put out into the world responsible citizens and always wanted our students to be healthy, right, emotionally and physically, because if not, how can you, how can you engage successfully in a career? It's all the bullet items in between that are new to many of us, right? Our students and the learners who come back and forth need to learn how to respond to volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity because that's the world we live in. And for many employers, that's the world they live in, right? There are lots of industries in which things are changing very quickly. And it's not just the technology or computer industries. There are a lot of industries. Engage the multi-generational along with the multicultural. That's new, the multi-generational. And how do we do that as institutions of higher education? Um, continue to learn in a workplace environment and take control of their own career development. We know already gone are the days where somebody gets a job and stays there 30 or 40 years like at least my parents did, right? We know that young people are switching jobs quickly. We know a lot of them are creating their own opportunities. They want to be in the gig economy. Very, very different and so they need to take control of their own um, career development and they need to learn uh, what that means to take control, how they continue to redesign their lives and reinvent themselves as they move out into the world. Um, learn to work in human robot partnerships, right? There are things that computers, that automation does better. And again, a lot of those things are very mundane, which really frees us up as human beings to do wonderful things. So we need to help our people um, across the board, whether it's, it's our faculty and staff working with young people or adult returning professionals, and those people really not think about it as an us versus them, but really think about it as a partnership. And it doesn't help that you have all of these, you know, Hollywood putting out movies of, you know, robots taking over or whatever, um, because it feeds into a fear of the unknown, right? Not that we think robots are going to take over, but it feeds into that fear of the unknown. Um, we need to help people learn to navigate access to expanding information. If you talk to employers and you look at the data on, on skills gap, even now employers don't believe we're putting enough people out into the world who actually know how to find and validate information, um, and that's only going to increase. It's only going to become, um, to become worse. And as historians, we do that all the time, but you can't count on us to do that. The rest of you have to be engaged. I'm teasing, I'm teasing. All right, the fun stuff now. What does all this mean for what we need to do as we think about what comes next in higher education? Um, I'm not pretending to have all of the answers. I've been thinking about this for the last decade. Um, and I think that the way we do this can be different across institutions, but I think these are some of the things that we have to think about, given the context 
and given what we want our learners at all ages and stages of their careers to be able to do, I think it's really important that we think about designing educational opportunities for mobility that's going to allow learners to easily move in, out, and among institutions, um, programs, and, and if we don't do that, my fear really is, as I said before, that there are third party um, people ready to jump in and do it. So, so a lot of you probably have heard about the boot camps. The boot camps started out with coding, right? Well, look at now what is offered. There are boot camps in finance, in design, in data analytics, in um, cybersecurity, six months, nine months, expenditure, you get out, you get a good job, and then you can continue to build on your educational experience if there are opportunities to do that. So six to nine months, fixed amount, get a job, four years, get out $351 a month. We really need to think about this because people are going to be making choices if there are good alternatives and there are some good alternatives out there. Learner agency, I think it's really important because we're talking about learners across the age and stage of their life and career span. And in business marketing and manufacturing, people often think about learner agency as customization, right? This is, gives control to the users so that they can achieve their preferred experience. Think about the fast food places where you go in and you pick your carb, your vegetable, your protein, right? I don't know, I like to do that. Many of us like to do that. Think of the online clothing sites where you choose a temp template, material, color. I've never done that, but my daughter-in-laws do it all the time. The, this generation is used to that kind of customization, which is giving them some control. Now, one could argue, and I think it's, it's accurate to say, younger learners don't know what they don't know, right? So for those, we may not want to give as much of that agency as we would to adult learning professionals, but we need to think about the issue around giving people what they want when they need it that's going to fit their goals, the time and money they have and are willing to spend. Flexibility, another key, and flexibility is actually key for both mobility and learner agency. And when we think about flexibility, we can think more about personalization, which is really tailoring an experience based on users' previous behavior. So think about Netflix, Amazon, right, that makes recommendations. And so we may want learner paths. So for cohorts of learners, we may have certain paths as opposed to customizing for an individual, right? And so really thinking about mobility, learner agency, and flexibility broadly is important. And the bottom line is that not everybody is going to have the time, the interest, or the money to dedicate to a four-year undergraduate degree as we move into the future, or to, to a two-year master's degree as we move into the future. So what does that mean for what it is we need to do? Do, do we need to change the things that we created? We created the four-year structure. We created the credit hour. We created the semester or trimester. We, as a sector, have the power to change those to adapt to what learners need in this day and age. Are we willing to do it is one question. But make no mistake, we have the ability to do that as institutions if we want to be bold enough to do it. And those things will, will um, be enacted in a number of different ways by a number of I different institutions. There's not one way to do this. So I'm not here to tell you there's one way to do it. I'm here to suggest that we all need to be engaged in that because if we don't take control, we're going to lose control. And that's not the doomsday message at all. I mean, it's a little anxiety inducing, <laughs> but, I really believe that, that w w you know, universities are just filled with creative, innovative people who are solving problems or working to solve problems all the time. And this problem to me is not as big to solve as poverty, social inequality. I mean, it's not because there are a lot of things within our control that when we're dealing with those societal issues are not within our control. So I really think we need to, to think about that. 
Um, I worry as a learning expert, I worry around about integration, right? So it's not as easy as we hear when we hear people talk about bundle and unbundle, which I think in a lot of cases is the right way to go, but people don't know what that means. So it's not unbundle and create chunks and throw them out there and let people pick and choose because a learner who is new to an area doesn't know what they don't know. So we, as the experts in our disciplines, we need to curate that process and make sure it's cohesive and integrative. So we need to create the paths and we need to show people what it is they need if they have a goal to achieve. Because in fact, we already are seeing adult learners coming back and saying, here's what I need to learn, I just don't know how to go about doing it. And so to me, integration is key to learning. I believe in experiential learning. I mean, the research is clear. You learn by doing. You learn through practice and only what you practice. And I think we really need to move away from the model that we've created and hung on to in higher education. You learn to ride a bike or play a violin or build a bridge or write a poem or build code by doing it, right? By engaging in the process and getting feedback. And so while there are times when we do need to transmit information to students, we really need to move away from the, the transmission as the major thing that happens when they're with us and send them off into the night to focus on their homeworks or writing their code or whatever. We need to remember learning as a process and we need as educators to have influence in that process. And right now for many of us, we don't. We do what we do in the classroom and we send them off to the place where learning happens, which is in the library or in the dorm or in their study group where we don't have an opportunity to intercede when they need it. And then finally, partnerships. We can't do this alone. We have got to connect with our colleagues in K through 12 who are struggling as much as we are to try to figure out how to prepare the young people when they come to us. We have got to connect more with community colleges, with foundations, with, with employers. I mean, it, we are all working toward the same goal, but in an uncoordinated way. And for those of you who have partnerships, whether it's in K-12 or with foundations or with employers or community, you know how wonderful those are and you know how effective those are. We need to think about that in a much more holistic way as institutions. So for me, the takeaways, um, well, I should say I'm not gonna go into this, but I want to just say, obviously we have to align and support people, processes, structures, and technologies. And that's a big part of everything I'm talking about. But again, we own that. We created the initial structures and, and processes and protocols and governance laws, and so that's in our control. Um, but the key takeaways for me are that for some institutions, their survival is going to depend on adapting and changing. For other institutions, thriving is going to require that they adapt and change. And not every institution is going to make the same decision, nor should they. But the question is, for the goals that you have at this moment in time, what decisions are you going to make as an institution to stay relevant? And then as a sector, what are we going to do to stay relevant? And I want to leave you with this quote because it really struck me, um, that it's an absurd conceit of a contemporary America that the only route to a middle class life must be through a four year university degree. I already said the boot camps which started out in coding have expanded. Apprenticeships which started out in the skilled trades, plumbing and electric and carpet, have expanded. So now there are lots of apprenticeship opportunities again in finance, in design, in cybersecurity, in analytics, in HR. And so people are adding value by educating and or skill building, right? And putting people out more quickly to be able to start their career journey with this notion as if you talk to people in boot camps or um, in apprenticeship programs, their plan is to figure out how to continue to get more education. They understand the limited nature of that. 
Um, but when they look around, they don't know where they're going to go next. There's an interesting book, and I only mention it, Ryan Craig, and it's called The New You, Faster and Cheaper Alternatives to College. And I only mention it because someone gave it to me saying there are 65 pages worth of alternatives to college in this book. And I read those 65 pages, and there are, and a lot of them are good alternatives. They're not necessarily bad alternatives. So I think that we really don't want to be caught off guard here. We don't want to be the ho hotel industry with Airbnb all, you know, taking over or the cab industry with Uber, Lyft, right? We really want to take control of our own future. And so, um, and so I, I hope that you took this in the spirit that I came to share it in that I don't think the sky is falling in at all, but I think we need to be realistic about the context that we're living in. And then I think we need to say, if our job as educators is to pre pre prepare both the next generation of people who go out into the world and then continually to prepare those who are out into the, in the world to make this a better society, which is why we're all here, to prepare young people and now younger and more mature people, then we really do need to rethink the way we've done things in the past, for which we have been enormously successful, and adapt the way we've adapted in the past so we really don't just stay relevant, but we really thrive, and people come back to us again and again because they know we can help them meet their continual learning needs. Thank you. Have a seat. Thank you. Great job. Maria? Rachel, my friend. So one of the things that our uh, learning and development vice president from Sony said is you have to add a little playfulness into your life. <laughs> So um, when you get the microphone, this is a microphone, and my job will be <clears throat> to throw it to you. <laughs> and then you take control, and your job will be to throw it to who you want to recognize with the next question. So I'm not going to throw it at you. Okay. <laughs> Maria's glad. looking at me like, uh, am I going to get it? I'm not Well, why don't you sports. take the first question Absolutely. before we... Uh, um, before I, we start asking questions, there are some empty seats in front if people are standing and who would like to sit. I know, just like our students who want to stay in back, but there are some. Um, thank you so much. That was a very stimulating talk. Um, I have a, a number of questions. I'll just start with one. Here at Grand Valley, you probably know this, we are steeped in liberal education. And so I'm wondering if you could just muse up out loud a little bit about that very disturbing phrase, learning animal, <laughs> um, and how we might help with that agility and flexibility given our foundation. Every single program is steeped in liberal education here. Yeah. So. so it's a great question, and it's a question that I love to answer both as a historian um, and as an educator. Mm -hmm. it, it turns out if you actually look across all of these um, um, skills gap surveys, so lots of really good organizations um, across educational and other organizations, foundations, have been for the last decade asking about, well, actually longer than that, asking about skills gaps, asking employers, what are you missing? Uh, you know, what are the employers, employees that you're hiring missing? Um, what you see in a lot of those are the foundational skills that in fact we provide when we talk about liberal education. So they will talk about critical thinking, perspective taking, problem solving, communicating across audiences and across different genres, dealing with ambiguity and complexity. And it's not only, I would say, for my discipline of history, right, that we deal with those, but across most of our disciplines, I would say that we deal with those. Now, the disturbing part is, why are we dealing with, I mean, we know they're deeply embedded in the disciplines that we teach. Why are we seeing employers saying they don't see them? And that's a whole other question, right? It's a question of transfer. We know one of the most difficult cognitive activities that people engage in is transfer across context. So often what happens is the critical thinking, the perspective taking, 
um, the dealing with ambiguity and complexity students are engaged in. We don't talk about it in an intentional way. And so they actually don't have the ability to articulate it, which means often they don't know that it's transferable. So I believe we are teaching those in a very narrow way and students don't have the ability to do it. But what this says to me is that no matter what it is we do to prepare our learners, both those going out into the world and those coming back and going out, is that the liberal arts have to remain key. Um, the um, dealing in teams and groups, being able to talk across disciplines, right? The perspective taking, huge, when you talk to a lot of organizations that have become more team-centric. If you don't have the ability to be able to understand other perspectives and communicate your own, that becomes problematic. And so when, we, when I talk about this, people often say, what about the liberal arts? And in my mind, they are and will always be key. The question is, how do we enact, help students to gain those incredible, I think of them as intellectual skills, intellectual foundational skills in a span less than four years because a lot of our folks aren't going to have the opportunity to come back four years. So that grounding to me is still incredibly important and I think employers would tell you it's incredibly important. I will just very quickly, because it's a good example, this is not what my kids call a humble brag, but it's not. Um, my son, um, my, son, my eldest son um, was a history major and poetry major um, at uh, University of Chicago. When I was at Carnegie Mellon, people felt so sorry for me. Uh, because their kids were going into engineering and computer science, and my kid was, you know, history and um, poetry. Um, he is 33 years old now and has his own, he and a partner have, his, have their own private equity real estate uh, company, which I actually know what that is now and could explain it, but I won't. Um, but, um, and, and they, they were able to do this he was able to <clears throat> get a job in private equity real estate because somebody reached out to him with an MBA to say, we've started this company you know, when he got out of college and um, we're having a hard time because we're MBAs and we're engineers and we don't know how to do the research we need to be done on the site and we are obviously not getting enough jobs. We're not putting together an argument in terms of presentation. So they hired him to come in with those skills, those foundational skills and, um, you know, 10 years later, he has his own, you know, multi-million dollar company. And people will often say, with a history degree, right, with no MBA or no engineering. And I think that is a testimonial to the, to the kinds of skills that are built, the intellectual foundational skills with a liberal arts education. So Wonderful. I'm going to throw this to Corey even though he didn't put his hand up, because I'd like you to meet Corey Moan, who was one of our guests from yesterday's uh, presentation, one of our speakers. Stand up, Corey, a moment. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Corey, um, tell them what you do, Corey, and then ask a question. Oh, oh good. Well, I usually don't talk into big fuzzy dice, <laughs> so that's not usually part of my role. But uh, no, I work at, I appreciate hearing uh, Susan's talk, and I've heard her before, and she's actually come out and seen us where we work, and. Uh, very much in line with what we try to do. So we work with high school students, juniors and seniors, and we connect them, try to get them connected as close to kind of what their passion and interest is as possible. And we do that through the lens of business and nonprofit partnerships. So we actually create teams of student consultants, and their job during their school day is not necessarily to work through a unit, but to rather work the 10th thing on the to-do list of a business or a nonprofit. And so they get to do that over the course of six to eight weeks or 10 weeks. And um, we learn quite a bit about what they want to do, and then we try to backfill them with uh, resources and coaching so that they can be as successful as they can in trying things out, ruling things out, before they get to a place like Grand Valley State to uh, be kind of hyper-focused on what is best for them and what they want to do. But very much the, the piece I recognize the most out of what you said, Susan, was learner agency. It is, our place is, that's one thing we believe in very strongly is learner agency and how important that is. So, thank you. who's got the you next You just didn't question? want to throw this thing, did you? I didn't that's want to throw it further than the first row. Look, <laughs> see, I can just do this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is... <laughs> <laughs> Things have changed. <laughs> so, <laughs> I really feel like I've been sprayed by a fire hose for the last 30 minutes. Um, 
I really do I feel that way. Uh, so I do feel like I work for a coal company, and we're just trying to figure out how we can make the coal company stay active for the rest of our careers. And I'm just, I have to admit, I'm wondering why? Like, uh, maybe it's best if our students go, if students that go to university just do a one-year program and learn the skills they need. It's, it's, I'm feeling right now, and I'm upset about it, but I'm feeling right now like, if you were, if you were to try to figure out how to teach these essential skills, would you, would you start by saying, we should write novels and poems, and we should write histories, and we should have students study those in order to learn problem solving or critical thinking? I have a hard time believing that's the most direct route to those essential skills. For all of my life, the essential skills have been an adjunct or a part of the teaching of those novels and histories and other things. So I didn't hear anything, I have to say, about those, they, they seem to have been, become purely instrumental now. They're, it's purely instrumental. And so I'm wondering if, if we are, should just, uh, is the only path to become a one or two year program? Are we in the way? Are we gonna keep on forcing our students to pay $351 a month with a new four year model? And if that's the case, why are we, why are we doing that? Why don't we just step aside and, and let them go? So I'm, I'm feeling a little lost right now. So I, I, the, the hose almost knocked me over here in the chair. <laughs> that's not a question. Thank you. Thank you. No, but I, I think it's a very good, it's a very good comment, and, I, and I've thought a lot about this. Again, you know, part of me doesn't, didn't feel anxiety because my kids were through, were through college and they're well on their way, and then we had this grandchild, and then it's like, oh my gosh, I have to worry about higher education for her, and I know what I want for her. And so part of the way I think about that um, because I, and I'm being serious when I say this, it's not just because I'm a historian, but I think that people need to understand history because if we don't, we know what happens. So particularly the history of, of our country. Um, and, and so I think things like that are important. I think when, I mean, I, so I don't want to get rid of those. Here's the question I ask, and I, I will speak personally, and it would be interesting if other people want to share their, their reflections on this. The question is, do they need it all at one time? in a four-year slot between the ages of 18 and 22. And I remember having a professor that I first loved and then hated in college. Um, and I remember one of the things he said, which I thought was incredibly insulting, because it was. And what he said was, um, education, higher education is wasted on 18 to 22-year-olds. And I thought, oh my god, what the hell are you teaching for then, if that's your feeling? Then I became a professor. And then it was like, OK, I sort of get that. <laughs> and um, my, my, my two sons and I have had this conversation. You know, my family were coal miners and mill workers. I was the first to go to college. Um, and I was excited to get to college. And I remember taking courses, um, a course on Ernest Hemingway, whose you know, writings I love. Except when I read them when I was 19, I didn't know what they were about. I mean, it was an interesting kind of, and when, after my kids were grown up, I decided that I probably really didn't appreciate Ernest Hemingway. And so I started going back and rereading those books. And the truth is, I got so much more out of them, which led my husband and I to say, you know, about 10 or 12 years ago, we ought to start taking courses. We ought to start, you know, the thing, I always thought I was bad in the sciences um, because when I was in high school, I talked a lot and I was always in trouble. And in physics class, I always got put in the back of the room, which um, I realized in retrospect, I couldn't see or hear. And so while I got A's and everything else, I always got C's in physics because I didn't learn physics. And I always thought I just wasn't good in physics. And then there came a point where I thought, well, I wasn't a good learner. The teacher who put me in the back was not a very good teacher. And I bet I could learn physics. So I think the issue is I still want my granddaughter to experience the richness of a lot of those kinds of things. Um, but will she have to do it in a four-year period of time, 
or do, will we have the kind of flexibility, mobility that throughout her life there are places that she can continue to come back to, to continue to expand her horizons, grow her knowledge and skills. And for me, the, the feeling less anxious is when I said, it doesn't need to all be done in those four years. Now, I will say that I still think it's incredibly important, and I know my president at Northeastern has challenged me many times around this, um, do we need a physical campus? Do students need to come to a physical place? And I still think for the 18 to 22 year old, it's incredibly important for young people to, to learn to be independent and autonomous, to learn how to negotiate a roommate problem. To, you know, I think there are a lot of things like that. Does it have to be four years? Pfft, that was arbitrary, let's face it. When, when higher education started this, we could have said six or eight years. There was no real intellectual reason. And it's not like they get everything they need in four years or they'd get it in six. I mean, that's, it was arbitrary. So I think the question really is, how do we think about it in a way that's really different and across a lifespan? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just like to add to this too, because I think that the feeling of discomfort is a good feeling. You know, I think it's an important feeling for us to have at various points in time. But I don't think it, it takes us from one model you know, an aggregated four-year model to a disaggregated model. I think there are many things. You raise the issue of time as one of the things. You could raise the issue of cost, you know. Um, take Northeastern and Grand Valley. Grand Valley gets 17% of its resources from the state. Northeastern is 75,000 a year total cost of attendance. Grand Valley is 20,000 a year total cost of attendance. The 17%, if I know my math, doesn't make up the difference. So the question is, you know, how do we think about cost? How do we think about debt? How do we think about time? How do we think about experience? How do we think about membership for continued learning? Um, so don't, I, I think it's hard not to let, and I, uh, the sort of challenge of the system become oppressive to us rather than an opportunity and an inspiration to take those components and begin to question them for our path, not somebody else's path, who we are. So I would just urge you to first stay with that feeling, you know, don't get uh, overly frustrated by it, and then explore the dimensions we can explore that fit with who we are. Thank you. I also, I will say, I was banned from the physics lab because I kept <laughs> blowing the circuit. So, yeah. Vandana, did you have a question? sit down and talk? No. Um, yeah. I'm Vandana, by the way. Um, um, I teach in the School of Communications. you got to speak into that a little bit more. Yeah. You're good. You're yeah. good. Yeah. It'll pick up your voice. <laughs> uh, I teach in the School of Communications. I think many of you know me. I've been here for 20 years uh, as faculty. Um, and uh, so I was, um, I was very aware of what you know, the, the, some of these things that you were talking about is as a faculty member and as a parent. Mm -hmm. So I have two grown children um, out of college and they're professional uh, people now. Um, one of the things that I w wanted to, and I think um, I'm going to include Roger's point here. Um, my younger daughter, who graduated from University of Michigan, um, until her third year, she did not have a major because she was enjoying every class she was taking mm -hmm. in different areas. Um, and finally, um, we, as faculty, you know, as as professor, I was telling her, you will not finish your um, four, uh, your college in four years if you don't decide. So, um, um, my husband calls it uh, get rid of mom's issues. Uh, major, which is she just picked one major, and that was international studies major. Um, I'm currently chairing a similar program, Area and Global Studies. Um, so it's 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 interesting how it's all coming together. And I said, okay, international studies is good, but as a parent, I was concerned about um, what kind of a job she's going to get, um, what's out in the marketplace that will um, that will give her, you know, a life ahead, right? Um, and I see those questions all the time at admissions events from parents. Um, 
what will they, what's the job ahead of them if they take this major? And so I'm, I'm thinking about this constantly. Um, one of the things that my daughter happened to do is to, is to build uh, a couple of technology courses on top of her degree. So she, uh, at, from mm -hmm. University of Michigan, she got her degree, but she came to Grand Valley and she took um, classes that allowed her um, some technical skills that gave her an entry into the marketplace. So she is now working as a, a finance consultant um, in, at Deloitte. Mm -hmm. So um, now after, she's been working for three and a half, four years, and now she's come back to this idea of, I want to be an artist. I don't want to be in this corporate world. But now she's managing the both things, right? She's, she's learned music on her own, and she's, she wants to create her own life in some other way, too. Um, so looking at that model, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm taking up this much time, but just wanted to provide that context of where I'm coming from. Um, Looking at that model of of how she went through, um, you know, in her what you call as becoming an adult and finding work, I was thinking about the same thing with my communication students uh, who are also you know constantly worrying about where yeah. they're going to get a job, and so um, I, I at that time this was at least three years ago I worked with the College of Business and some of the students did take that kind of a cluster of programs, um, and I would say nine students did find very good jobs in the marketplace um, a, you know, in, uh, through their technology skills. So I think it's possible to give some skills in order to make a step into the, the world that provides you some employment, mm -hmm. right? And then, um, then they can, again, find their way. Nobody stays with their job forever, right? They find their way. I think that's what I'm thinking, that we probably, when we think about the skills, no, don't take away poetry and, and novel writing and all of those, all of those things are important. Um, the, the idea of liberal education, so to speak. And then, um, but I think uh, the context, and, and I think you affirmed what I was thinking about was, that given the context, it might be important to give them those skills so they are confident to step in the marketplace. Um, and also, you know, think about uh, the transferable skills idea. I think everything is transferable once they have that base um, of, uh, of broad education. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you for the comment. Sure. Anybody else with a question? I did. Oh. Thank you. You ready? I think so. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Okay. Oh, okay. You got two. All right. Oh, oh sorry. Do you want to go first? It doesn't matter. Okay, okay then I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'm going to suggest. Yeah, exactly. I, yes, agency. <laughs> because we had a lot of hands up. If you can keep the question short, I yes. would appreciate it. Um, so my name is Samantha Rhodes, and I'm in engineering. Um, so one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is experiential learning, which I think is very key and which is, um, which is uh, it part, of the, a part of our program, a very integral part of our program, um, and which our students, when, they, when we do senior exit surveys, that's the one they choose as what was the most important part and what they loved about our program. So um, I want to sort of echo that. Um, but my question about, about, and I was listening to Vandana's story, is this idea of technology and um, uh, sort of more millennial type programming built in with our um, classical idea of what a liberal education is with art and history, uh, is to also include technology as yeah. part of and parcel of um, a well-rounded liberal yeah. education and to introduce that um, for, for our students as well and for all students, um, really taking a course on, um, hey, maybe you shouldn't accept that email from a Nigerian prince because you know, that might cause you problems. <laughs> um, th these, are, these are real world skills, don't click that. Um, yeah. Is yeah. is a frequent thing in our house. Don't click that. Yeah. Um, so maybe something like that. Yeah. So, so uh, first of all, I love the humor with this group. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, 
Now, I just want to I just want to echo and underline what you said. I think it's important for those students in the liberal arts. I totally agree to to really expand into technology because it's here to stay. And I want the engineers to understand the human experience and design within that human experience and societal, right? <laughs> um, so I think that's really, I mean, I think it's important. It goes two ways, right? The other thing I want to say about is sort of both of these is that um, employers are more interested now in understanding the knowledge and skills and choosing employees based on knowledge and skills than they are the degree. And they're really, I mean, it, in a way, again, this was a, going from a faculty member to an administrator. It was like a slap in the face to hear them say, that what, what the piece of paper has become is a piece of paper. What it tells us, the transcript and the resume, what it tells us is that they persisted through four, five, or six years, right? It doesn't really tell me about the knowledge and skills. Um, and, and that's, to me, that's sad that that's the perspective. But that perspective is out there with a lot of our employers. And the reason that they're loving things like boot camps and apprenticeship is that people can show them something that they've actually done and engaged in, which is indicative of the knowledge and skills they have. And so I think we need to think about all of those things as we're thinking about where we go. And I want to just be clear, because I get challenged by engineers all the time. I spent a, no, 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 I know you're not. But, but I want to say this, because it's important. <laughs> um, I work at the National Academy of Engineering. I spend a lot of time with engineers. And one of the things I want to say is, I want to make sure that people building bridges spend the time learning how, structures, right? <laughs> you know, I, that's not where I want to cut, right? I don't want to say engineers can take a year. I mean, there are a lot of us. I want to make sure that my nurse knows how to insert the IV, right? So it's not compress things. It's not, right? We have to be smart about how we do this. And it's really about think about what they need now to enter when we're talking about 18 to 20 year olds and then what they can continue to gain as they expand. And for those who are out there, what they want and need as they come back. Sorry. Mary? Yeah, and you've, you've answered my question a little bit just by answering her question, so I'll keep it pretty short. But um, I teach in the graduate physical therapy program and <clears throat> we're trying to look at different models yeah. and we do, offer experiential learning, and we do have uh, a lot of um, uh, experiences within the community, and we are uh, in, in trying to adopt to technology. So a lot of those things we're doing, but I feel like we're asked to be doing more and more with less and less. How do we do that? Change is hard, we realize that, but how do we, we struggle with our increase in class size, we struggle with how to make our education get, continue to be meaningful and important with fewer and fewer resources. Thank you. I, I would love to. Uh, I don't have an answer for that. I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Susan. Give me that box. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I think what you've described is a very real problem, yeah. and I think the whole way that we approach and finance the way in which we work today and the way we need to consider. What would you say in any other area? We'd say, let's do some experiments. Let's create some pilots. We're not going to evolve from one model to the other model you know, overnight or have multiple models for different sets of needs. So we're going to have to find some ways, and we will here at Grand Valley, to support the innovation. Um, that people want to do in this space. Now, it was an interesting conversation yesterday. Do you, do you go in that direction, or you, do, you, do you do some things in absolute whole cloth you know, versus experiments on our existing system? Either way, it's experiments. We've got to find some way to support some experiments, because you can't just stretch yourself another five times and work in today and work in the future. So that's what we really need to consider. Maria, I, you wanted the ball. You can speak with no, 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 no. I was just kidding. Yeah. I think. <laughs> Tim, are you going to say something? Yeah, I, I caught it because I was next to her, but I'll say something. I, unlike Roger, I don't feel like I'm hit by a fire hose, more annoyed by a garden hose. But I think I'm in the School of Communications. Uh, I run the Advertising and Public Relations program. I think we've been nailing the experiential learning for years. 
And what kind of annoys me is that we've done that too much and we're letting go of the theory. And I, I think it's a false dichotomy. There's a, there's a family friend of ours that says, it's like suspenders and a belt, you need them both. Yeah. And I met yesterday with seven prominent corporate communication officers from West Michigan, a group I'm starting. And this morning I met with an alumna who's been out for about uh, eight years. And they said the very same thing. You know, we need them both. We need everything you're talking about. And I'm starting to do that with some of my classes. But I tell my faculty, I think if we let go of the traditional mm -hmm. theory, um, and maybe not, you know, they're not all doctoral students as undergrads, but they have to understand how to apply it and know not just what to do, but mm -hmm. why they're doing it. And yeah. that's what employers are looking for. Yeah. They want that kind of thinking. And I, I think instead of, I, we do need to respond to our culture, but we shouldn't pander to it. We should lead our culture and own what higher education should be and say we need them both. And there's, there's a middle ground here that I think we can work smarter and not harder and try to achieve some of these things. But I'd like you to respond. No, to amen. I totally agree yeah. with you. It's the combination of theory and practice. Being able to, I mean, this is the difference if you think about it between, you know, what some people would call training and education, right? When you train somebody, it's usually for a very particular thing that they can do very well, but they don't have the ability to kind of think about what comes next, ideate, whatever. And those people have, let's face it, very limited uh, bandwidth and, and sort of contribution. They may be happy staying in their little box, but they, you know, stay in their little box. If you only know theory and you don't have the ability to apply it, great, you're a big thinker and you can't do anything. And we all know lots of people like that. <laughs> so it's the combination of the two. You're absolutely right, absolutely right. And so, you know, amen, I am totally, you, you said it and you said it well. And the other thing is, we don't want to pander to what is, is, you know, the world is saying. What we want to do is respond in the way that we as educators, because we are educators, right? And what we have to do is say, you know, chill, back off, let us figure out how to do it. We don't have, by the way, you know, seven years. It's not put together a committee, take three years, give a report. We did, come on, we've all done that and been, I've done it, my share of it. We don't have time for that. What we have to say is here are the needs right now in the future, and the future's here. Employers are already saying automation has taken over a lot of this stuff, and what I need is the ability for my people to be able to think more creatively. How can you help me do that with these you know, 10,000 people I have because we've automated? And so I think we want to lead that, I, absolutely, the response. And I, they don't know how to do it. I mean, if they knew how to do it, they would be putting a lot of money into their L&D budgets, and they'd say do it. And when you talk to directors, of L&D, they're very uncomfortable in this space as well, and they're looking to universities and colleges to respond. Yeah. Thank you. I think I have a, a similar follow-up along those same lines. I mean, you know, I wonder if part of our response wouldn't be a critique of what was being asked for. It seems to me you've laid out a really nice tension between what employers want from us and what we, you know, what we have done in the past. But... <laughs> It seems to me like the, it comes out really nicely in the Robert Reich quote. I mean, the way you interpreted it was as though Robert Reich was telling us that we need to think about reshaping our model. But I suspect he may have well been saying that the system is unjust if it demands of us a four-year education, and therefore the system needs some critique. And it seems to me part of our response would be maybe to even critique what employers were asking for at all. And that might be some of the skills that, that we've done really well for a long time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it could be. I think what's interesting here is, and, and I will say that um, when we talk about employers, it's really interesting to kind of distinguish between, you know, it, when we talk at Northeastern to the CEOs, they are absolutely telling us what it is they want, right? We want people who have cultural agility. We want people who have the ability to blah, blah, blah. When you talk to the hiring managers, they need to hire somebody to get the job done. So there's even a tension within organizations, right? It sounds good to say we want to hire for learnability. And in fact, everybody wants to do that. But the manager who's hiring needs to get these 17 things done every week, and he needs to hire. So there's a lot of tension in there, too. And I think that's part of what you're suggesting is that's part of why we need the dialogue. It, it can't be us preparing and handing it to them or them telling us what we need. It needs to be a dialogue because we both come from very different perspectives. And I think informing each other and designing and creating with that in mind is going to be good for everybody. 
trying to use this. Hi, Susan. So I uh, read recently the average kindergartner will change over their lifetime at a minimum. They'll have 17 jobs and they'll have five different career changes. So from your perspective as a learning scholar and expert, you know, how can we, what can we do to help students um, prepare not just for their first and second job, but for their last job? Yeah, oh, that is such a great question, and I didn't plan it, and I love it. Um, um, President Mantella has heard me say this many times over and over again, that, that as universities, for as careful as we are in the language when we're writing our scholarly papers, we are so sloppy in, in a lot of our language. And people continually talk about lifelong learners, and um, no disrespect, but when I ask a president and a provost, not these people here, but what do you mean like by a lifelong learner? They'll say, you know, learners who can continue to learn throughout their lives, right? <laughs> um, and, I, and, and I say that kind of jokingly, but seriously, that I think we need to ask this question, and it's why I say to employers, what do you mean by learnability? And they will say, well, you study learning, <laughs> you tell me, right? Here's what I mean by learning um, learnability is that people have the ability to be self-directed autonomous learners. What does that mean? It means that I am given a task. I clearly understand the task. I recognize what I know and what I don't know. I have a sense of what I need. And what I need may be I need to learn it or I can pull someone else in the organization in to work with me. But then I have an ability to monitor my performance or my teams and my understanding over time. And if I'm not getting it, then I recognize I have to go out and I have to find a coach or I have to read more, I need other examples or whatever. But it's being able to actually direct my own learning, right? And look at what we do. We direct it all of their lives, right, all the way through. When do we give students the opportunity to practice that kind of, and it's a skill, it is a learnable skill. So I think it's really important for exactly the reasons you said, particularly as we're working with undergraduates, that we help them because it's a learnable, teachable kind of thing. Most adults, you've all learned it through experience. You have been given something to do that you didn't know how to do and you had to figure out you know, who to go to and how to do it. So over time you learn it. But my philosophy is always, why do people have to learn everything over time if it's something that we could teach them actually early on that's gonna benefit them? So that's my definition of, of learning. Well, I think we're just about out of time, and I want to respect everybody's time. I want to thank the provost for co-hosting this with me. If you have thoughts, what we want to do is we want to think about our own boundaries and the way that we think about the world and just start pressing against the various perspectives. There is not, Susan Ambrose is not coming as the definitive perspective, nor is she foreshadowing the way forward. What she is bringing for us is really important issues to consider, and then for us to take them in, in our way and with our academic assets and with our student experience um, and defining our future. So again, we're wel we welcome you because we want to have a series of these over the course of the year to bring forward your thoughts and ideas of things we need, dimensions we need to explore. Um, we have just the, set, the next one set but the rest of the spring and summer we'll be uh, hosting and happy to have your suggestions. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for being willing to be uncomfortable. Appreciate that. And uh, thank you, Susan, for, for leading us.